1985 was a devastating year for American intelligence, so much so that it was dubbed the Year of the Spy. 14 Americans were arrested that year on charges of espionage, and those were just the ones who were caught. From the CIA, the FBI, the NSA and the Navy, American intelligence institutions were thoroughly compromised. The majority of these men and women spied for the Soviet Union. The communist behemoth, only six years away from its undoing, remained the greatest enemy and chief rival of the United States of America. It is perhaps for this reason that someone like the subject of today's video managed to sail undetected for more than three decades, spying on behalf of a sleeping giant in the Far East. He moved unseen, feeding his handlers information that greatly helped the Communist Party of China to identify traitors and inform its US foreign policy. He was a scholar and a brilliant linguist. He was unassuming and perceived as a loyal, hard-working employee. It was these traits that made him, as some would claim, the perfect spy. Larry Wu Tai Chin was born Jin Wu Dai on the 17th of August 1922 in Peking to a moderately wealthy family. We then pick up the story in 1943 when a 21 year old Larry was a student at the prestigious Yen Ching University studying languages and economics. He was evidently a good student and had already become fluent in English. It was this skill and his proficiency in three Chinese dialects that saw him recruited first for the British military mission and then the US Army as a translator and interpreter during World War II. When he returned to university to complete his studies, his campus had become a hotbed of communist activity. Larry's roommate was a man by the name of Mr. Wang. The two men would spend hours in deep conversation discussing the politics of the day and their future career prospects. Larry and Mr. Wang found common ground in their sadness at seeing the deterioration of Chinese-American relations. Mr. Wang suggested to Larry that he use his linguistic talents to help restore diplomacy between the two countries. If only someone could help to interpret American attitudes and foster greater understanding between the two great nations, Larry could definitely be that person. To this end, Mr. Wang introduced Larry to a man whom he was told was a communist security officer responsible for monitoring American officials. This man encouraged Larry to apply for a job at the US consulate in Shanghai after he graduated from university. He was told to simply keep his eyes and ears open and to see what he could learn. And so this is exactly what he did. In 1948, Larry started work at the US consulate where his linguistic talents soon saw him appointed as the lead translator. The following year, in 1949, he married his first wife, Doris Chu, with whom he would have three children. In May of 1950, and after the communist victory over the US-backed nationalist government in the Chinese Civil War, Larry was transferred to Hong Kong when the US consulate was forced to move out of mainland China. When the Korean War broke out the following month in June of 1950, Larry was deployed by the US State Department to work with the US Army services as a translator and interpreter. His primary role was to assist in the interrogation of Chinese prisoners of war who had fought alongside Kim Il-sung's North Korean Army. It was during this time that Larry began meeting with a man named Dr. Wang who is not to be confused with Larry's former university roommate, Mr. Wang. Larry shared information with Dr. Wang about the prisoner interrogations he participated in. Initially, the information he provided was very basic, ranging from the food the prisoners were served to their living conditions and US interrogation methods. As the weeks progressed, Larry started providing more personal information about those interrogated. He identified prisoners who remained loyal to China and those who were not. As a result, thousands that were released from the POW camps after the war found themselves in prison camps back in China for thought re-education. An unknown number of others were executed outright. The first reward Larry received for sharing this information came in the form of payment of 2,000 Hong Kong dollars. 
This was a small drop in the ocean, but the money whet his appetite for more. Larry became a compulsive gambler and frequented the seediest of Hong Kong strip clubs. He had expensive vices, and he knew he had found a way to finance them. When the Korean armistice was signed in 1953, ending combat in the Korean War, Larry was ready to move on to his next assignment. He moved with his wife Doris and two young children to Okinawa, Japan, where he took up employment with the US's Foreign Broadcast Information Service, or FBIS. Operating from the Kadena Air Base, the FBIS was in fact a division of the CIA and was chiefly responsible for translating Chinese radio broadcasts and other media into English. Larry's work was critical to US intelligence as these broadcasts were virtually the only window the Western world had into Chinese intentions on key geopolitical issues such as Korea and Taiwan. It was while working for the FBIS that Larry's relationship with his handler Dr. Wang came to an end. Replacing Dr. Wang was O Chi Ming, an agent of the Chinese Ministry of State Security who was known to Larry only as Mr. O. Larry's position offered him insight into what the CIA was most interested in, judging by the content of the broadcasts he was required to translate. While he didn't have access to top-secret information, the intelligence he was gathering was of a different sort, the kind that allowed Chinese intelligence to gauge US sentiment towards reported happenings in mainland China. Armed with this knowledge, the Chinese could choose to either restrict press coverage of certain events and issues, or spread misinformation on those topics. While this doesn't seem like very much, the collection of this sort of information was a key part of Chinese intelligence gathering. The difference between the methods and objectives of Chinese intelligence compared to the Soviet Union and America could not have been more stark. Where the Soviets and Americans came in like a raging bull in a china shop, the Chinese approach was long, slow and pervasive, almost imperceptible. Where the Americans and Soviets were heavy-handed and direct, the Chinese were subtle and cautious. The Soviets, like their American counterparts, relied on a small number of individuals to produce highly selective intelligence. The Chinese, on the other hand, operated by flooding America with people from all walks of life. From students and scientists, to businessmen and emigres, the Chinese relied on large numbers of people to produce small quantities of intelligence. It was this cautious approach that allowed Larry to operate with relative ease. Working from Japan presented some difficulties for Larry that he had up to that point not yet experienced. He was no longer in Hong Kong where meeting with his handler was low risk and travel to the mainland was easy. The Chinese methods of espionage called always for in-person meetings. Since his work was a slow burn, he would meet with Mr. O oh in Hong Kong at least once a year for a briefing session. This he did for the next eight years while living at the airbase. As the 1950s were drawing to a close, Larry was offered a new golden opportunity. He was about to be on his way to live in the United States of America. In January 1961, Larry was transferred to work at the FBIS Bureau in Santa Rosa, California. His work was essentially the same, to translate Chinese radio broadcasts into English based on the CIA's classified intelligence requirements. Larry continued to feed information back to his handlers, the true value of which was for the Chinese to either confirm or refute intelligence that they had already procured through other sources. Given that Larry was now operating from within the heart of America, contingencies had to be put in place for his continuing operation as a spy. He was given the phone number of one Mr. Lee, who lived in Toronto. While he continued to make trips to Hong Kong every few years to be debriefed by Mr. O, oh, it was far easier for Larry to cross the undefended border between the USA and Canada to deliver his intelligence. Another of his new contacts was a Catholic priest living in New York named Father Mark Chung. If Larry found himself compromised and needed to make a quick exit, he was to meet with Father Chung in the confessional booth at the Church of Transfiguration. Larry had divorced from his wife Doris in 1959 before arriving in America and commenced a new relationship with Chao Chin Yu, known also as Kathy, whom he met while working in Japan. 
Larry and Kathy were married in Reno on the 5th of August 1963, and in 1965, Larry Chin became a naturalized U.S. citizen. Not only was Larry extremely proficient at his job, he was also charming and popular among his colleagues. His knowledge of Chinese culture and social norms and expertise in various dialects made him the go-to person for anybody in the intelligence community needing to communicate in Chinese. He always received glowing performance appraisals. For the next five years, Larry continued his work for the FBIS in Santa Rosa. When the West Coast branch was shuttered, Larry was offered a position at FBIS headquarters in Roslyn, Virginia. As the 1970s dawned, Larry was heading to the heart of US intelligence, which is exactly where his handlers wanted him. Since he was going to now become a fully-fledged employee of the CIA as an analyst and a translator, Larry Chin was subject to a routine but extensive background check. No information could be gleaned from the 28 years he spent living in China, however the 20 years worth of history that could be uncovered from his life in Hong Kong and since moving to America revealed nothing untoward. A polygraph test likewise raised no red flags. Larry listened slowly as the questions were posed to him first in English, then translated into Chinese. Of course, he could understand both languages. It wasn't long before Larry was granted a top-secret security clearance and was settling into his new role working directly for the CIA. Larry was responsible for the bulk of the translation duties for Chinese material and communications. To do his job, he was often given complete access to top-secret U.S. intelligence reports. He was able to profile both the CIA officers he worked with and the agents they were communicating with in the East. When translating communications, Larry would ask about the recipient's age, gender, level of education, local dialect, and other personal details. All this information Larry would pass on to Chinese public security. These details resulted in the compromise of an untold number of American informants and agents. We can only speculate as to their fates. Larry was only a few months into his new job when a top secret document came across his desk that would not only determine his future as China's most valuable asset, but would also play a role in determining the geopolitical landscape for the immediate future. For 20 years, and since the Chinese Communist Party had seized power, the doors of diplomacy between the US and China had remained firmly shut. When Richard Nixon was sworn into office as US President in January of 1969, the first signs of a shifting in attitudes could be seen. Nixon and his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, were secretly planning a first diplomatic mission to China. The top-secret report held in Larry Wu Tai Chin's hands detailed the so-called Nixon-Kissinger opening toward China and US plans to visit the country. Larry knew he had struck gold. He quickly photographed the report and immediately contacted Mr. Lee in Toronto via payphone. He then traveled to Canada via New York, where he handed over the microfilm containing the secret report. That roll of microfilm was sent back to China, developed and printed, and eventually made its way to the desk of Mao Zedong himself. Thus, in 1971, when Kissinger began to discuss plans for the US president to visit China, the Chinese had advance warning of US intentions and were receptive. On the 17th of February 1972, US President Richard Nixon stepped off Air Force One at the Beijing airport with hand outstretched. Nixon later declared that as he shook hands with Zhao Enlai, the premier of the CCP, one era ended and another began. Nixon's trip was a resounding success. He even declared it the week that changed the world. The restoration of relations between the US and China also served a dual purpose, straining China's ties with the Soviet Union. Larry Chin's espionage in this case had the result of strengthening US-Chinese relations, a goal which had got him involved in spying in the first place. Back in China, Larry was regarded a hero for his role in advancing Sino-American relations. For the next nine years, Larry continued his spying work, flying regularly to Toronto and occasionally to Hong Kong to meet with his handlers to pass on more information. In all, 
Larry Chin received approximately $180,000 US dollars from the Chinese government for his work, which is approximately $1.2 million US dollars in today's money. This second income stream opened up a whole new world for Larry. Expensive restaurants, vacations, women, and gambling were the order of the day. These last two were vices that proved irresistible to Larry. He continued to frequent strip clubs and gambled away huge sums of money at the blackjack tables at casinos in Atlantic City and Las Vegas. Yet he managed to keep this aspect of his personal life mostly a secret from his employer. He was discreet with his wealth, and when any colleague happened to notice that he was living beyond his means, he managed to explain this away as casino winnings. What he didn't lose at the casino, Larry Chin used to invest in real estate, amassing for himself a property portfolio worth $700,000 spanning Baltimore, Washington and Las Vegas. He also maintained a bank account in Hong Kong in which he stashed away a nest egg of $200,000. After a long and illustrious career, Larry retired from his position at the CIA in January of 1981. He was awarded the Intelligence Medal for the service to his country over the decades. He didn't tell his Chinese handlers that he had retired as he wanted to maintain his status as their prized agent. He still made trips to Hong Kong where he fed back information he was able to glean from staying in contact with his old colleagues. He would call his former office mates and friends ostensibly to catch up on news, but in reality he was sussing out who was working in which department and who was assigned to different cases. On the 4th of February 1982, Larry made a decision that would set in motion his undoing. He flew to Beijing to attend a banquet held to honor him for his work for Chinese intelligence. There he was awarded the honorary rank of Deputy Bureau Chief in the Ministry of Public Security. He thus joined the rare ranks of those decorated by both sides in an intelligence war. He was also given a golden parachute of 40,000 US dollars. Life was good for Larry Chin. Yet little did he know that an official working for the Chinese Ministry of Public Security had been secretly working with the CIA as an informant. This man was about to defect to the USA and lift the lid on Larry's decades-long spying spree. Codenamed Plainsman by the CIA, Yu Changshong was a walk-in, a defector that made first contact with the USA unsolicited to offer his services. Volunteers like this are always treated with circumspection due to the high chance of a dangle operation, and details surrounding Yu Changshong's decision to betray his country are unclear. Speculations as to his motives range from political disillusionment to money. While still in China, Yu Changshong tipped off the CIA about a Chinese mole within the ranks of American intelligence. He didn't know the name of the man, but said that the mole had flown to Beijing in February of 1982. The CIA spent six months evaluating this tip-off, not wanting to involve the FBI if it didn't need to, and always of course not wanting to admit that it may have a spy within its own ranks. It was only on the 28th of September 1982 that the CIA determined that there was likely some truth to the matter, and only then passed on the information to the FBI. It was on this day that a report landed on the desk of FBI Special Agent R.C. Smith. Conveniently for the CIA, the report said that the mole was likely in the FBI or the military. Agent Smith assembled his team in anticipation of an extensive mole hunt, assigning Special Agent Tom Carson to investigate. Carson opened a new file, which due to the lack of information, he simply labeled UNSUB, short for Unknown Subject. He wasn't going to exclude anyone from the ambit of his search, certainly not the whole of the CIA, on the basis of their say-so alone. All he knew was that the suspect was a Chinese male who had travelled to Beijing to meet with his spy masters to be honoured at a banquet. The tip-off from Yu Changshong contained two key inaccuracies that sent FBI investigators on a wild goose chase for nearly a year. Yu said that the spy had flown on a Pan Am flight to Beijing and that he was a current employee within American intelligence. In reality, Larry Chin had recently retired. Chinese intelligence just didn't know it. And he had flown on China's national carrier, CAAC, not Pan Am. 
Special Agent Tom Carson quickly established that there had been no Pan Am flights to leave for Beijing on the 6th of February. He nevertheless spent weeks scouring the airline's records to no avail. Once he realized his time was being spent in vain, the FBI decided to widen its search by listening in to hours worth of telephone conversations recorded through surveillance of the Chinese US Embassy. By January of 1983, Special Agent Tom Carson was about to lose hope. Then, he stumbled upon a recording of a telephone conversation on the 5th of February 1982. This was just one day prior to the dates on which their mole had flown to Beijing. The call had been made by a Chinese official at JFK airport to the Chinese embassy. He called to let his office know that his flight to China had been delayed by a snowstorm. No American federal employee would ever have been authorized to fly on a Chinese airline, but if the flight had been arranged by Chinese intelligence, well, it was entirely possible that the mole had been on that particular flight. Carson wasn't able to get a passenger list from the CAAC flight, but Plainsman's tip-off also said that the mole had flown back into the US on the 27th of February 1982. Checking flight records, he saw that CAAC Flight 983 had landed at the San Francisco International Airport on the date in question. He rushed to request a passenger list from Customs. Among the names were four passengers who were American citizens, but one Chinese-sounding name in particular stood out from the rest. The address provided by this passenger was in a suburb in Washington that was home to a large community of federal employees. Running this name through the FBI database, brought up a match confirming that this passenger had been subject to a background check and had a security clearance. Carson immediately contacted the CIA to check whether he was one of their employees. No, they said, but he used to be. While all circumstantial, the evidence pointed to Larry Wu Tai Chin as being unsub. He then became the FBI's prime suspect. Tom Carson and his team immediately started combing through every document that ever crossed Larry's desk in the three decades that he worked for the CIA. Yet he came up with nothing. There was no direct evidence whatsoever to indicate that Larry had been acting as a double agent. Had Larry Chin still been employed by the CIA, the plan would have been to put him to the test, bug his office with hidden cameras, provide him with falsified information that nobody else had access to, and then see whether it landed up in the hands of the Chinese. Of course, with Larry having retired, this was not going to be possible. Without being caught in the act, investigating and then prosecuting Larry Chin was going to be a very difficult task. It was decided that the FBI's best bet was to attempt to lure Larry back into the fold as a consultant. Despite being offered a handsome reward for his services, Larry refused after he was told that he would need to sit another polygraph exam to restore his security clearance. His excuse was that he was too busy with his work with his alma mater at Yenchen University. The FBI had no option at that point but to simply wait and watch. On the 13th of April 1985, a warrant was granted for the FBI to install telephone and microphone surveillance in Larry Chin's apartment. For the next two years, Two FBI special agents, fluent in Chinese, listened in to every conversation Larry had. They inspected Larry's post to identify possible contacts through return addresses and postmarks, but their warrant did not authorize the opening of his mail. While listening in to his telephone conversations, investigators learned of a darker, previously unknown side to the man adored by his American colleagues and bosses. Larry routinely engaged in phone sex calls with women he referred to as his nieces. His conduct was so bad that FBI investigators would go on to describe Larry as a lecherous scumbag. One day an incident occurred between Larry and a teenage girl in the laundry room of the residential complex in which he lived. This led to a charge of assault being laid against Larry, which was later dropped. As a result of this, the Chin family moved out of their home to another apartment. This meant that the FBI had to reapply for a warrant, resulting in a few weeks delay to the investigation. And it wasn't long before Larry again found himself in trouble, allegedly grabbing at a teenage girl as she rode her bicycle past him. 
no charges were laid following this incident. Eventually, the FBI thought they were onto something when they heard Larry speaking to a woman from Chicago in which he requested that she bring the machine. Agents were disappointed to learn that Larry Chin was describing a sex toy and not some gadget he intended to use to commit espionage. Larry Chin's marriage to his second wife was on shaky ground. Kathy knew of his sexual escapades and actively tried to prevent him from being unfaithful. On one occasion, Larry knocked Kathy to the ground when she tried to block him from leaving in his vehicle to meet with his mistress. Larry's marital woes saw him move out of his apartment into another unit next door. The FBI was again required to apply for their surveillance warrant, delaying the investigation by a further few weeks. In June of 1983, the FBI received a tip-off from plainsmen that Larry was planning a trip to Hong Kong and then Macau. Surely he intended to meet his Chinese handler, and this was the FBI's opportunity to catch him red-handed. The difficulties inherent in American intelligence conducting operations in communist China meant that Tom Carson's request to follow Larry to Hong Kong was declined by the CIA. The FBI nevertheless tailed Larry to Dulles Airport and intercepted his luggage as it passed through baggage handling before being loaded onto the plane. Searching through the bag, the FBI came up with nothing unusual except for a mysterious key marked with Chinese characters and the number 533. As it turned out, this was a key for hotel room number 533 at the Chengmen Hotel in Beijing, a venue known to be a hotspot for intelligence activity. But the key alone was not any smoking gun evidence. As such, the FBI were powerless to do anything to prevent Larry from leaving the US. Operation Eagle Claw was grinding to a halt. For two years, investigators had been searching but had not been able to find any direct evidence of Larry Wu Tai Chin having committed an act of espionage. With their key source, Plainsman, being safe within the USA after defecting, the FBI decided Larry Chin would need to be confronted. It was hoped that interviewers could bring enough pressure to bear on Larry for him to confess. An interview team was assembled and FBI agents knocked on Larry Chin's door on the 22nd of November 1985. They asked if they could have a friendly conversation with him regarding a possible leak to the Chinese intelligence service. Whether it was curiosity or hubris, Larry agreed to let the men inside to answer their questions. Sitting at his dining room table, Larry remained stone-faced when he was told the mole had been active within the CIA during the 1970s and 1980s. The questions asked by the agents elicited little response, and so they decided to turn the heat up. Risking years of prior work and investigation, they laid it all out on the table before Larry, telling him that they knew about his trips to Toronto and Hong Kong, and that they knew he was a spy. Larry's initial response was denial, but when the FBI agents told them about the key to hotel room number 533, cracks began to appear in Larry's confident demeanor. How do I know you aren't bluffing? he is reported to have asked. The FBI agents then threw down their final gambit, telling Larry that they knew about his previous trip to Hong Kong in September 1983, where he met with O Chi Ming and had asked for 150,000 US dollars to aid him in settling matters in his divorce from his wife Kathy. At hearing this, Larry Chin knew that his number was up. There was only one other person in the world who knew those details, and he faced the sudden realization that his handler, Mr. O, had either been compromised or had defected to the USA. He knew he had no chance of escape and thus decided to cooperate with investigators. Operation Eagle Claw was successfully brought to a close on the 23rd of November 1985 with the arrest of Larry Wu Tai Chin. The embarrassment felt by American intelligence was acute. Larry Chin was yet another mole uncovered in the disastrous year of the spy that was 1985. It was essential to U.S. state prosecutors that Larry Chin be brought to justice, and quickly. Between the 4th and 7th of February 1986, Larry's case was heard in the Federal Court of Alexandria in Virginia. One of the major charges against Larry was the time he spent spying for China during the Korean War. Prosecutors framed it as follows. Here was a clear act that damaged the national security of the United States in the midst of a military conflict. Americans were dying, 
and Larry was spying. In his defense, Larry Chin testified that he had passed classified information to the Chinese only as part of a personal mission to overcome Chinese paranoia and to help reconcile historic differences between China and the United States. This was never going to be enough of a defense. On the strength of his confession and the evidence led at trial, the jury found the 63-year-old guilty on 17 counts of espionage, tax evasion, conspiracy, and failing to report foreign financial and gold transactions. Larry Wu Tai Chin was sentenced to an astonishing 133 years in prison and fined 3.3 million US dollars. Facing the rest of his life behind bars, on the 21st of February 1986, Larry Chin committed suicide in his cell, suffocating himself with a plastic bag that he tied tight around his neck using his shoelaces. A CIA source later said that during a visit from the Chinese consul, Larry was told that so long as he died without revealing any of his secrets, his family would be taken care of. Prior to his untimely end, Larry was preparing for a full debriefing with the CIA. As the debriefing never took place, a full damage assessment could not be undertaken, and US intelligence was never able to establish the full extent of the harm that Larry may have caused. While Larry Chin may have started his spying journey many decades earlier with the naive goal of mediating relations between the USA and China, these noble ambitions played second fiddle to his desire for wealth. This episode served as a rude awakening to US intelligence of the threat of espionage from communist China. Given the access Larry Chin had to raw intelligence in the course of his work, the CIA and FBI had to assume that there was almost nothing that the Chinese had not seen. This caused a shift in focus with US intelligence agencies realizing that for far too long they had neglected China, being so focused on the Soviet bloc. At the dawn of the new millennium, Chinese espionage against the USA quickly eclipsed the height of Soviet collection efforts during the Cold War. And thus, fresh battle lines were drawn setting the stage for a new kind of intelligence war.